I mean, I'm I'm a really big fan of this film, and just listening to that interview and thinking about the film has put a smile on my face. And I, I've spoken to a lot of people who've seen it, and everyone says the same thing, which is, doesn't it feel like at a time when things are you know potentially quite poisonous in the in the, in the world, all the stuff that's going on, isn't it great to have a movie that literally leaves you feeling so good? But the reason it does is because much like the comedy that Steve Coogan was talking about it does understand that balance between bitter and sweet. Um, There's always a difficulty if you're going to take two comic icons and attempt to sort of reproduce them on screen. The worry is always people have got a version of those people. I mean, you know, I remember when my kids were young, we had the the Laurel and Hardy DVDs um, that I would play over and over again because I always really enjoyed them. And kids can really enjoy them because the slapstick, the physicality of the comedy. There are two elements to the key performances. One of them is getting the, the sounds of the voices right. And... It's it's really lovely the way in which John C. Riley he's got the soft consonants and the sort of the gentle drawl, the kind of almost whispered speech. And Steve Coogan's got that much more staccato, much more brittle speech. So, th- so you recognise the register of the speech really well. But it's the conversations that are physical that are you're talking there about the double door routine, the way in which they move. I mean, yes, absolutely plaudits to the makeup and prosthetics, and indeed to Laurie Rose, the cinematographer, for giving the whole thing this kind of autumnal glow. I mean, the film does, it glows, it really does. Um, But it's the way in which they move, the the reproduction of the physical comedy works really well. The other thing, of course, is it is a story about two love affairs. It's a story about love affair between them professionally, that they have, you know, they're, they're joined at the hip, if not at the heart sometimes. And then their wives, who apparently came in in sort of later drafts of the script, those parts became more and more. And the, the, the characters of the wives are, are like equal and opposite to the husbands, and they are absolutely brilliantly done. So you have these two, these two sort of. At one point, uh, the character uh, Bernard Delfont says two double acts for the price of one, and you have these this kind of wonderful playing off between these. It's it's definitely it's a it's it's a four piece cast at the centre of it. Uh, Shirley Henderson delivers. <laughs> Shirley Henderson has got a brilliantly sort of understated way of delivering absolutely withering lines, one of which I was about to quote, but I'm not going to because I will spoil it for when it's in the film. But watching the interplay between those characters is really lovely. But essentially, it's a story about two people who have joined. There has been a betrayal in their past, and it's a question of how the, whether that betrayal is going to repeat itself. And then the irony is at the beginning of the film, they're talking about their divorces, and now they've both they're both very happily married with very very supportive partners and the people whom they're doubting are each other so it's about that is a kind of that's a sort of central relationship you know quadrangle about who do you trust and who's who's got your back and so that's the sort of that's the center that's the thing that makes the movie work in terms of that emotional core to it and beyond that, it is funny. I mean, it is genuinely charmingly funny, not just in the reproduction of things that you're familiar with, but also in the dexterity with which those comedy moments bleed into the real world. So when they're checking into a hotel, stands falling over the suitcases in a manner that could be in one of the films. When they're walking up a flight of stairs to a railway station, they drop a trunk, you know, in the manner of music box, which I know you feel exactly the same way as I do about, you know, we both of us have said in the past, that's, you know, one of the most hilarious, you know, the piano. Yes. Yeah, yeah. No, so, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I, I feel this is going to go beyond the news. So I'll, I'll take a breather. But just to say that it works because when it needs to be funny, it is funny, but it wouldn't work if you didn't have a central core of kind of melancholy and longing, which I think it does have. I have more to say on this subject. How much more do you have? I have a few more minutes, and I have some very astute and well-thought-out points that okay. I, I shall make. I think we'll be the judge of that. And if you have just joined us, you've missed... The uh, first half. St- the first half, and Steve Coogan and John C. Riley talking about being Stan and Ollie. We'll get to your... Uh, correspondence in just a moment but I think Mark was winding up for a big finale. Yeah, just to finish to say that that thing about the the two couples that in the in the form of Shirley Henson and Nina Ariandi you have Lucille Hardy and Ida Laurel and they again like the central uh, pairing of Stan and Ollie they are they're sort of chalk and cheese and they're 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 very different and they appear to be there's got, they've got a kind of bickering relationship they're stuck with each other on the on the long journey imagine that from america to to england and uh, they're both protective 
of their husbands in their own way. There's this whole joke about the fact that um, that Ida used to be, you know, I was in film by Preston Sturgis. <laughs> the thing about <laughs> Buckingham Palace, Buckingham Palace, that is not a palace. St. Petersburg is a palace. And they are, they are a really, really funny pair. But the reason what they do is more than comic relief, is more than just two double acts for the price of one. Is as I said, they complete that that square. The square of the relationship is not a triangle; it's a square. And as the film moves towards its conclusion, there is a mirroring of something that happens on stage and something that happens in the audience between Stan and Ollie and between Ida and Lucille that I thought was just beautiful. I thought it was so well done and so sort of perfectly done. There's also a really lovely moment. I think this is really important that any of the, the darkness that's in there, and there is, you know, there's this whole thing about, you know, you betrayed me, you made a movie without me. That was 16 years ago. Yes, but you did it. And will history repeat itself? That even with all that stuff there, the uh, the director and the writer both remember all the way through, so it's John S. Baird who uh, directed it, and it's written by Jeff Pope. They remember that the core is that you have to feel you know warm and engaged that actually what this is 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 a sort of it, it's a it's a loving tribute and there is a really lovely moment when rufus jones who is the uh, is this promoter bernard delfont who up until that point he describes himself at one point in uh, the press notes as his character was part bob monkhouse part sort of you know carnival huckster and we meet him and he seems like he's untrustworthy and all the rest of it but there is a moment when he sees an act that they do on on stage and he comes backstage and he tells them this is wonderful he says he describes it as beautiful madness he says it's a moment of beautiful madness that reminds me why i love this profession and he plays that scene really well he plays it really beautifully because you suddenly get a sense of oh this is you know there is there is heart and that's what i liked about it i really felt that it it oozed heart and soul and uh, and again, that's why I say that particularly in times as sort of tumultuous as they are at the moment, it's not a film that's saccharine sweet. We have one of those that's coming out, you know, this week, which we'll talk about. It it has got that poignancy at the heart of it that means that it cuts through. It's got the you know the the hint of lemon in the in the drink. It's there, but the thing itself is affectionate and warm. And uh, no, I really I really loved. It. I've seen it twice, and I really I really really enjoyed it. When we were talking to Eleanor Oldroyd, yes, who loved <clears> it earlier, too, at one thirty, uh, she loved it, and she'd been on Twitter talking about it. And then Rufus Jones joined in that conversation and wanted Ellie to carry on after two o'clock just to sort of fight his cause. Well, he doesn't need. I mean, I need it because no. you love him anyway. <clears> yeah, but don't. But you know the scene I'm talking about. I do know. And didn't you find it? It's very touching because that that is one of those things that could have gone either way, and I think it's just it's just right. 